And I thank God for each and every one of you all being here today. We are excited about the journey of faith that God has launched this ministry on. We're about building faith and connecting families. Amen? And so EBC, we're ready to roll. I don't know about you, but you, you got to strap up, get ready. Amen? Uh, get, get your energy uh, focus in the right direction. It's time to go. It's time to move. It's, it's too, it, for too long, we've been laying back in the cut, just kind of putting on cruise control. It's time to press forward. God's got to work for this ministry to do. And guess what? You are a part of it. Yes, you are a part of what God wants to do through this ministry. You have gift things that we need. So quit sitting on your gift. Touch your neighbor and say, neighbor, stop sitting on your gift. Hallelujah. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke, the 10th chapter, the gospel according to St. Luke, chapter number 10. And we're going to begin our reading at verse number 25, the gospel according to St. Luke, verse number 10, not chapter number 10, excuse me, verse number 25. The gospel according to St. Luke, chapter number 10, verse number 25. Um... And, and we'll read a few verses here just, just shortly. But, you know, we, we've, we're continuing to delve into a little deeper into this message series that we've entitled, Do You Really Care? Do You Really Care? And we, we, are, we are focusing in on and trying to get us to come to a complete and revelatory understanding of what it really means to care. Amen. We first start this off by dealing with the subtopic growing through adversity. And I told you, like no other time do we see our need for God and his son Jesus along with our need for each other than during times of adversity. Am I right about it? You know, people who people who aren't even really don't really have uh, they're not really saved. People who, who say, but just, you know, just barely in there, you know, carnal minded Christian. Even people when they're going through something, the first thing they, they holler out, Jesus. First thing they holler, oh, my God. Don't even really have a relationship with God, but OMG. Is that, what, is that the right acronym for when y'all text and you go, OMG? Okay. See, when, during times of adversity, during times of turmoil, during times of sickness, or, or when we're at a low point in our life, like no other time do we see our need for God and our need for each other. So I, I got news for you today. There are going to be times in your life, even though you're a born-again believer, you're praying, you're speaking in other tongues, you're reading your Bible, there'll be times in your life where God will allow some adversity to come so that you'll see your need for him and your need for other people. Can I get a witness? The second thing that we talked about uh, is, uh, was on last week, we talked about loving people. Can I get a witness? Loving people. Because in Matthew 22, verse 36 to 39, Jesus was asked, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Uh, this is the first and greatest commandment. He secondly says, It's equally as important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. That's what Jesus said when he asked, What was the greatest? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And the second one is equally as important. Guess what? Love your neighbor as yourself. We need each other. So since we cannot, you know, we can't give what we don't have, I told you on last week. Is that right? The order of that commandment is significantly important. Love must be vertical between God and us before it can be horizontal between us and other people. If your love with God is not right, if you're not passionate about the things of God, you will never be able to to, to appropriately in the right manner be able to engage and show love to other people. It starts with your relationship with God. Some of us have trouble loving people because we're not passionate about God, if you really want to know the truth about it. We're not passionate about God. Oh, I, I didn't say you didn't come to church. I didn't even say that you wasn't a born-again believer. What I said is that too many of us in the local church are not passionate about God. Passion. Y'all know what passion is, don't you? When you are passionate about something, you, 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 you do some of everything to show that you're passionate about that thing that you're passionate about. We, we, will, we will go and buy jerseys of our favorite team that we are passionate about. Is that right? 
if you're a Saint fan, a Cowboy fan, if you are a Vikings fan, or uh, whatever, whoever, uh, fans are, is, is short for fanatic. They just cut off the last part of it, but it's a fan. You are a fanatic. Are you fanatic about anything in life? God is saying, if you're going to be able to love people in the manner that I described, because remember what I just read. He says, the first commandment is, love the Lord thy God with all the heart, mind, and soul, which is the first commandment, right? And then he said, the second commandment is as equally important, Gary, as the first one. And here's what the second one said. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, how many of y'all going to be able to do that without God's help? Love your neighbor as yourself. See, when yourself wants something to eat, you go buy something to eat for self, right? But when your neighbor wants something to eat, you're not necessarily going to go buy something to eat for them, right? Am I talking to myself up in here? He said the second commandment is equally as important as the first one. Loving your neighbor as yourself. Now, you think about that for a second. You can't do that without God's love, agape love abiding on the inside of you. You cannot do that. You can't love your neighbor as yourself. I, listen, I love all of y'all, but, but, but again, if it come down between me and you, guess what? <laughs> I mean, come on, if we're honest, right, come on, we're honest. If it comes down between me and you, somebody comes in, I mean, you know, just think about that for a second. Are you going to jump in front of the guy and say, kill me first, don't take him? That's my pastor. He baptized me. He married me and my husband. He married me and my wife. And don't you shoot the pastor. Shoot me first. Some of y'all, if somebody came to that door with that gun, y'all, <laughs> and y'all start saying something like, well, he anointed. God's got his back. He always saying that. Huh? See, it takes passion for God to love people. Y'all know that's true. There are some folks who are very difficult to show love to them. And it's going to take God's passion, his agape love on the inside of us to be able to do that. Amen? So, so again, uh, love must be vertical between God and us before it can be horizontal between us and others. When loving God is our passion, loving others is a natural reflex. Now look at the text that, we, that we're going to get into today. Because again, we're talking about in trying to develop a concept, a construct, a theological mindset as it relates to care ministry. Because I want this church to be a caring church. Y'all guys, do y'all remember before we get there, remember we talked about, we said that caring is, is about, it's people, not issues. Everybody say people, not issues. We said it's presence, not programs. Everybody say presence, not programs. And third thing we said was is faith, not fixating and fixing. See, the problem that we're having is, is we don't really have a true construct of what it really means to care. And so we think caring is all about fixing somebody's problem, giving them some food, giving them some money. And those things are a part of what we do. But if you limit your caring to just doing stuff for people, you've missed what God said. He said, love your neighbor as yourself. You can't do that without the passionate love of God on the inside of you. So look at the text. Let's, can, we, can we roll? The Bible says this, one day an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. He says, teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Can y'all read with me? Verse 26 says what? Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus told him, do this and you'll live. The man wanted to justify his actions, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied with a story, okay? A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jer Jericho and was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along, but when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. Y'all know this story, right? A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on what? The other side. 
Then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his words with olive oil and wine and bandaged him. So soothed his wounds, excuse me, with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? Jesus asked. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. Yes, now go and do likewise. Amen? Now, again, what, what I want to focus on today is our subtopic today is going to be talk, we're going to talk about being attentive. Being attentive. Everybody say, everybody say being attentive. In other words, I'm going to put it this way, pay attention. Have you ever been told that by your parents? Pay attention. Have you ever been told that by a teacher in school? Pay attention. By a coach, pay attention. We got to be attentive. Now, let me remind you, each and every one of us, each and every one of us need to understand that it's, it's, it's easy to miss that thing which you're not really looking for. It's easy to miss that thing that you're not looking for, which y'all agree. If I told you that I had lost my keys somewhere in the sanctuary, it's up under the bench somewhere, um, you wouldn't ordinarily just get up and come to service and look up under the bench and try to find my keys, would you? Because you weren't looking for them. Is that right? You were not looking for them. It's easy sometimes to miss that which we're not looking for. What I want to do through this series is to put something on your mind for you to begin to look for. Can I get a witness? Now, now watch this, watch this. When our schedules are full and we have all these different things that we got to take care of, guys, it's easy to disregard the people that God put on our hearts and put in our pathway in order for us to minister to them. How many times have you heard Christian believers, saints of God, say, oh, man, it's just so busy. It's just so busy. I got this going on. I'm running here and running here and running there. Oh, I'm just busy, 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 busy. Anybody that's been your testimony, oh, I got so much, I got to do this around the house, I got to go to work, I got I to do this for mama, I got to do this for daddy, I got to do this, and, and, and pass out and want me to come in and do stuff for the church, and, and you know, I ain't got time for all that. <laughs> come on, how many of you have been guilty of saying, I don't have time for that stuff at church that pastor said we as a ministry are going to embrace and get involved in? Anybody been there before? Uh, you, you, don't, you don't even have to raise your hand. I don't, want you to, I don't want you to embarrass yourself, but I know I'm telling the truth. Sometimes we get going in life and we get to moving that we forget to look for those people because that's who God places along our pathway in order for us to minister to and to show that we really do care. Can I get a witness? To love people, guys, it's, it's extremely important that we are attentive and that we tune in to those who are around us and that we care enough to demonstrate compassion and share the hope that's within us. We got to care enough to demonstrate compassion to people. Now, there's often times in the scripture where the Bible will say Jesus had compassion upon them and he healed them. One thing that compassion would do when you have the compassion of God abiding on the inside of you, compassion will move you to action. Everybody say, compassion will move me to act. Say it one more time. Compassion will move me to act. You know, one, one of the core principles that we, that we have, uh, I want you to just uh, write this one down. The core principle for this particular lesson today is action required. Everybody say action required. It, 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 your Christianity has to move beyond coming to church on Sunday 
and come back again next Sunday and sitting in the pews, enjoying the praise and worship, leaving out the doors, and don't really even focus and have a, a God mindset throughout the rest of the week. But you come back next Sunday faithfully. Great to see you. You even give your tithes and your offerings. Thank God for you. But the Lord desires action on our part. He desires action. Because remember, remember the greatest commandment was, love the Lord thy God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And the second one is equally as important to that one is, love your neighbor as yourself. So we got we got this action required. Now, now, I'm going to tell you something. A lot of times, people's situation and their circumstance are not obvious to us. It's not right there before our eyes. That's why if you're not looking for certain things, you'll miss it. And many times in the church, there are people who are hurting and they're quietly suffering and won't ever complain, won't ever say anything to you. But if you learn how to relate to people and not just be transactional with people, come on now, then you'll begin to see what's going on beneath the surface. I told you before, God will give you a spirit of discernment when you are being intentional in being relational with people. So many times we, we boil care down to a transaction. I gave you some money. I gave you a ride. Hello. I fixed your car. I fixed your bike. Or I, I did this. Or I brought some food to you. And so now we said we care. But I told you, you can give money, you can give food, and not really care. See, caring in a biblical sense goes a lot deeper, deeper than that. So, so when we look at this, the people, circumstances, again, that we deal with in, in, in life are seldom as obvious as the circumstance of this man that we find in this parable. It was very clear what his problem was. He just got robbed. He, 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 the Bible says he was beaten up and left for dead. He was half dead. So it was obvious what his issue was and what his problem was, but there are many people who God places in our path where the, where the, where the, where the, where the problem is not so obvious where we can see what's above the surface of the water. Remember the iceberg example I gave you? We can see what's happening and maybe the lack of money, maybe, maybe, this, the, the, uh, maybe a depression, depressed state on, on top of the water, but what's beneath the water that's driving the stuff on top? That's what we got to get to. Because the only way you can get to what's beneath the surface is you got to be relational. Because most people, come on, if we're honest about it, most people don't go around telling you what's going on with them really. Most of y'all in here, if I were to come and, 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 and ask every one of you all, point blank, face to face, man, how are you doing? I'm doing good, Pastor. Can't pay your bills. You and your wife on the way to divorce court. Huh? Your children cutting up. They won't mind you. You're about to get fired on your job. All that's going on. But you will tell me it's all good. Huh? Am I right about it? Or if I'll ask you the question, are you good? What are you going to say? Yeah, most of you going to say yes. And when I say, are you good, that could mean a lot of different things, right? You good? That means everything okay with you? You all right? You good? If we out somewhere, get ready to go to eat, you good? That means you have money? <laughs> Am I right? You good could mean a lot of different things, right? If I just got through counseling with you and your wife, and I said, you good? That, that means, are you all right with what I said? Are you receiving it? Are you going to apply it? Or are you going to ignore me? See, God wants us to become relational with people because most people in the ordinary course of life aren't going to just start telling you where their hurts are, where their pains are, and what they're dealing with. So we got to become relational. Because no, nobody really, I mean, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't tell what's going on with me with a stranger. And how many know you can be in church with people, fellow born again believers, and they be strangers as it relates to you being willing to share what's going on with you? Most people aren't honest. They hide. Everybody say, you hiding something. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, what are you hiding? Jesus used parables. Listen to me carefully. He used parables to captivate. Yes, yeah, some of y'all saying, yeah, I ain't telling you what I'm hiding. I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep on hiding. 
But guys, in all honesty, when we get through with this message series, Do You Really Care?, what my goal is, is to, is to be able to get us to understand the importance of caring and begin to demonstrate what it really means to care by entering into relational uh, partnerships with fellow believers in Christ, okay, such that that person who you are interfacing with will feel comfortable enough with you to say, listen, things are not going the way I want it to go. There's some things that I'm dealing with and I don't know how to handle. Can you pray through this thing with me? Can, can you walk with me? Through this, can you walk with me through this and not run away from it when I tell you all my stuff? Because see, some of us are afraid that if we tell our stuff, people are gonna run away from us. But I'm here to tell you if you are a child of God who loves God passionately, you don't run away from people when they're going through a valley experience, you run to people when they're in their valley experience. And you show the genuine love of God. Do you really care? That's what I want to know. Do you really? really care. So Jesus, again, he used parables to captivate his audiences and to compel people to reflect on a story and attach importance to what is being inferred through that parable. A common explanation of the parable of the Good Samaritan is that as Christians, we are expected to be neighborly, you know, friendly, come on, uh, kind, generous, helpful. We're, we're expected to be neighborly to the people we encounter and who are in need. And that's, that's a pretty fair assessment. But, 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 but it goes a little bit deeper than that. That's not, again, that, that explanation is not untrue. Amen. But knowing the parables reveal, knowing that parables reveal moral and spiritual truths that are meant to impact our beliefs and how we live out our faith, it's essential that we discern the underlying message from a parable. Again, when we look at the Good Samaritan, all of us, how many of y'all have heard this parable growing up? I mean, that's, you've heard probably countless sermons on the Good Samaritan. Am I right about it? And when you read that parable, which aspect of it do you concentrate on? Is it questions that are posed by that expert in the law? Uh, or do you focus on the blatant disregard that this rabbi and this Levite had for this man who was hurting? Religious folks, believers in God that, that, that just blatantly ignored the man. Do you focus on those guys or do you focus on the, on the disdain between Jews and Samaritans? Or do you focus on the man on the road and the good Samaritan? Or whatever, whatever you focus on, that, that this, this parable has more meaning than just be nice to people. We got to dig a little deeper, okay? So let's, let's, first of all, let's look at the lawyer, the lawyer, the lawyer. The parable starts out, go back to verse number 25 with me right quick. The parable starts out by telling us a lawyer in an attempt to test Jesus. Everybody say test. See, the enemy is going to test you. God, well, let me back up. The enemy is going to tempt you. God is going to test you. The enemy will tempt you by trying to get you to do wrong. God will test you to try to build you up and help you to grow in your faith. And there's a difference, right? The devil never tries to strengthen you. He always tries to tear you down. So, but the lawyer in this parable here uh, starts out trying to test you. He asks this question, what shall I do to inherit eternal life. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Now, now, now go to the next verse here. Realizing that an expert in the law would surely know the answer to that, <laughs> rather than responding, Jesus challenged him to answer his own question. Watch what Jesus said. Well, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it, dude? I like, man, Jesus is bad. Boy, he's bad. He's bad. You, you, when you're trying to trick him and, and get him all discombobulated, you, you, you're wasting your time. Have you ever ran across those folks who are always trying to come up with some kind of question what, you know, to try to discombobulate you and get you all messed up? See, what I would tell you is stick to the Word of God and don't get into all them crazy questions that people have, and they really don't want to answer to it. They just want to try to mess you up. Stay with the Word. Everybody say, stay with the Word. So, so, so Jesus challenged him to answer his own question, and the lawyer does so by reciting the great commandment. He says, uh, 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 he says, 
uh, watch what it says here. The man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. He knew what the great commandment was, right? All right, now watch this, watch this. So Jesus affirms that he has the right answer when he says, look at this next verse, right? Jesus told him, do this and you will live. Go and do likewise and you're going to live. Well, instead of doing, actually loving God and people, it seemed like the lawyer was more interested in showing off how much he knew. He, he was more interested in debating. He was more interested in keeping things at the intellectual level. See, there's a lot of Christians who all they want to do is talk about the word, show you how much knowledge they have, show you how much intellect they have. They want to take over the Sunday school lesson from the teacher to show you how much they know, but they have no interest in doing what the word says. They're intellectuals. They want to show you that they're smart. They want to show you that they can dissect a passage. They want to show you that intellectually I am superior than you, more superior than you are. And see, God is not interested in, in you just being intellectual. God is interested in all of us being obedient to his word. Are y'all listening to me? So, so, uh, so some believers, I've ran across those kind of folk who want to tell you I can quote more scripture. You probably can quote more scripture than I can, but I want to know you live in that scripture. Just quoting it doesn't do any good. All right, now watch this, watch this. So, so we have the lawyer. Let's go to the next guy in this, uh, in the, the next two characters in this parable is the priest and the Levite, right? The priest and the Levite. Scripture translations suggest that the priest or the rabbi and the Levite, who was a religious official, certain translations suggest that they went around the man who was laying there on the ground by the road, okay? They went around the Jew. Now, now check this out. The rabbi and the Levite were of Jewish origin. They, 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 were, they were naturally born Jewish people. They were part of the nation of Israel. And they see, they see one of their blood brethren laying by the wayside. Hello? Just because somebody looks like you don't mean that you're going to get some favorable treatment from them. Hello? I'm, I'm going to tell it myself right quick. I, I, I said I wasn't going to tell it, but I'm going to tell it. I was coming back from yesterday from um, taking some of Sandra's stuff uh, back to school, and Junior Boy and I were just cruising along down the highway. Now, and on the way over there, I had seen about seven or eight state troopers on the side of the highway. As a matter of fact, there was one in between Tallulah you, you know anybody in Tallulah? I need some help. Okay, look. <laughs> but, 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 but we were <laughs> on the way over. I saw look at that dude up on that tree over there. State trip. But on the way back, I was not paying attention to how fast I was going. Now, I knew I was going fast as staff and what I should have been going. But I, I usually stay within that, that barrier, that, 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 that zone that they allow you to go and they won't pull you over. As a matter of fact, when I got pulled over, <laughs> the state trooper actually told me, he, he said, Yo, hey man, he said, he said, Yo, he said, thank you for having a good attitude. I did have a good attitude when he would give it, because I was guilty. I was doing 84 and an 8 in a 70. <laughs> now, don't, y'all, y'all better stop. See, see y'all think y'all sin don't stink. <laughs> I know good and doggone well y'all ain't all in me. And some of y'all were doing 90 probably. But, but, but guess what, guys? Listen up. I, get, I got pulled over. I'm talking about going back. See, these guys were Jewish who saw the Jew on the side of the road. So, so when um, and something inside of me just, I don't know what it was, but, but, but when I got pulled over, I knew he was coming after me. So, you know, when I saw him start to ease out, Stafford, I just kept rolling. And I got, over, got to the right-hand side. I said, he going to come in just a second. He just, boom, and pulled up right beside me, and I pulled over. And he got out, and it was a brother. I mean, I don't, I don't know if he's a Christian brother, but he was, a, he, was, he, was, 
He was of the same race and ethnicity that I, that I am in. And something on the inside of me said, this brother will give me a break. <laughs> he was nice. He took my license, went back to his car, wrote the ticket, and told me, sir, your court date is on October 6th. If you disagree with this, you can certainly come and appeal it in court. And he says, have a nice, I shook his hand before he gave me a ticket. I shook his hand after he gave me a ticket. And he, here's what he said. He says, I appreciate your attitude. But he didn't erase that ticket. <laughs> he didn't give me a warning. But just because somebody looks like you, I'm talking about the, the, his blood brethren, the rabbi and the Levite saw a fellow Jew in a bad condition on the side of the road and they kept going. Now, that ticket thing had nothing to do with this lesson. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> the man was doing his job. Hello? So why would I get mad at him because he was doing his job? Some of y'all get mad at people for doing their job. Come on, how do you feel when you get a ticket? What, what do y'all, some, some of y'all, he should be out there chasing criminals. I ain't no criminal. You are a criminal when you break the law. <laughs> Is that right, Marrera? Is that what that guy told you? <laughs> you know, I got to bring you into this too. That, that's, State trooper told you, you are breaking the law, ma'am. You are a criminal. Now, now watch this, guys. Watch this, watch this. These guys, the priest and the Levite had a blatant disregard for this man who was on the side of the road. And, and guys, regardless of our perceived status and what we may consider more important responsibility, Jesus expects us to demonstrate our love for, for people by engaging. Hear me carefully. Even when that means humbling ourselves and going out of our way to care for others. See, it's easy to care when it's somebody's right along the way. But what about when it calls us, causes you, causes me to do something that, that takes us out of our normal routine? God expects us to do that. But these guys here, the priests, like the religious folks, the Bible even said, watch this, guys, watch this. Can you look back with me? Uh, the, the Bible says this in verse number, let's go to verse number 31. 31, Luke 10, 31. Let's read together. Ready, read. By chance, a priest came along. But when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. This priest did like many of you do. You see somebody out there, think they're going to want something for you, put your head down, go over here, and pretend like you didn't see him. Don't look at me like that. Pretend like you didn't see. He didn't want to get too close to him, but he crossed over to the other side before he got to it. And moved right on past him. Look at it. Look, watch, watch. Look at the next verse. Real, everybody say religious folks. Now watch this. A temple assistant. Look at this dude. Walked over and looked at him lying there. Went over there. Mm, dude, you in bad shape. Ooh, somebody messed you up. And walk right on. Is that what it says? Can read it out loud on purpose? A temple assistant walked over, looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. So the priest and the Levite, I think, were very irresponsible because they should have known better. The, the lawyer asked you the question was, 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 was of, uh, of Jewish background, and he knew the commandment. He says, little Lord thy God with all his heart, mind, and soul. And in the second one, the equally important, love your neighbor as yourself. You can't love your neighbor yourself. You can't love the, 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 the Jew that got beat up on the side of the road if you're not passionate about loving God. You'll, 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 you'll cross over to the other side, and you'll go look at people and then keep moving. So the third, the third component, or third two people that, or let, let, the, I guess the, the 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 third thing we look at is the Jew and the Samaritan, because history tells us that there were there was disdain and hatred between Jews and Samaritans. So that's that's one aspect that people will focus on in this parable, and so as such, it would it would have been unthinkable that a Samaritan would care for and show compassion to this Jewish man on the road. 
Let me, let me bring up the modern day term. What if that guy was a neo-Nazi on the side of the road? Yeah, y'all got quiet, didn't he? What if, what, if, what if that guy was, was, was the guy who you, you, just, you, know, you just hated in school? You didn't like him. Or that lady who you, who, who, who you hated or did, did you bad, hurt you deeply. What if it was your ex-husband, your ex-wife on the side of the road? Or don't bring them on the side of the road. What if it was your ex-wife, your ex-husband that needs some help? Somebody laughed at that one. <laughs> what, if, what if it was somebody who you had not processed, amen, God's, amen, un, God's uh, uh, unconditional love towards, and you hadn't extended the full forgiveness that God told you to, forget, to extend to that person? And now that person and that person needs come, comes into your, into your pathway, along your path. God allows you to cross path with that person who you don't care for very much. For whatever reason, it was the coworker that got you fired. But now they need some help. What you going to do? Jews and Samaritans hated each other. And I told you this before, guys, as a Christian, as a born-again believer, it, 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 it is a contradiction in terms to say that you love God and you hate people. You, you, you cannot truly have passion for God and hate someone because of the color of their skin or hate someone because of what they did to you or you know what they did to somebody else. See, God is a God who exudes love. I want some of y'all to think about this right now because Jews and Samaritans didn't have anything to do with each other. But here we have a Jew on the side of the road and we got a Samaritan who actually comes and does something about it. Jesus used this extreme example, and, and this extreme example is a clear indication that we are called upon to genuinely love and care for others, including people who we may not know, people who we may not even like, and people who we wouldn't normally associate with. Now, now it's, it's interesting to me that this, 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 this parable is located between the great commandment. Go to Matthew 22. This is, this is prior to Jesus' death. Matthew 22, verse number 34. Come on, y'all. Come on. Matthew 22, verse number 34. Look at this right quick. Y'all still tracking with me? Talk about being attentive. See, along our, in our life, in our pathway, God will put people who are hurting, who need help, who are going through an adverse period because like no other time, I told you, then during times of adversity and turmoil, do people realize their need for God and their need for other people. And God will make sure that you realize you need him and that you need other people. Watch this text. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees with this reply, they met together to question him again. Watch this, verse 35. One of them, an ex his, another, his, 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 the same passage again. One of them, an expert in the religious law, tried to trap him with this question. Here we go. Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Here we go again. Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, your heart, mind, and your soul. Look at the next verse. That's what? This is the first, command, first and greatest commandment. Next verse. That's what? A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as what? Yourself. All right? Now, again, you go over to Matthew, the 28th chapter. Go to Matthew 28, verse number 16. Matthew 28, verse number 16. That was, you know, you know great commandment and great commission. Watch this, Matthew 28. Then the 11 disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. Verse 17 says what? When they saw him, they worshiped him. This is, this is post-resurrection. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some of them what? Doubted. Next verse says what? Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Next verse says what? 
Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Verse 20 says what? Teach these new disciples to do what? To obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the, end of the age. Now again, if, if, if he had already given them a commandment to love the Lord thy God with all your heart, mind, and soul and to love your neighbors yourself, then everybody who we who we usher into a relationship with Christ Jesus, we should be teaching them to, that, that when you're really passionate about God, when you love God, you know, you got to love with all your heart, mind, and soul. You got to love your neighbor yourself. That is, that is a hallmark of what it means to really care. It's to embrace God's command and let it be a part of our life, okay? So, so we got the Jew and the Samaritan. And lastly, we got the man and the good Samaritan. Jews and Samaritan didn't get along. Y'all know that, right? But the man and the good Samaritan. Verse 36, look at verse 36 back in Luke 10. Verse 36. He says, now which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by the bandits? Jesus asked. In 37, he lets the guy answer the question. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus says, yes, now go and do the same. All right? Now again, if you were to be asked the question, which one, uh, which of these three do you think proved to be the neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? Was it A, the priest? Was it B, the Levite? Or was it C, the Samaritan? Uh, you know, the obvious answer is what? The parable is called what? The good Samaritan. So that would be the obvious answer, right? But, but, but I, I think this lawyer may be catching something here because he could have just said the Samaritan. But what he said was, look at it, he says, the one who showed him mercy. The one who showed him mercy. His answer is significant as it appears to show that he's beginning to realize it's less about the legalistic question, which establishes only knowledge, and it's more about actually loving people. It's about faith in action. Everybody say faith in action. See, we got to realize that, that faith in action is critically important. Now, watch, here's some key thoughts. I want you to just jot these down as we go through them right here. Key thoughts. Because this parable really is showing us some things about ourselves. Because what I want you to do is, as you're sitting there, ask yourself this question. Do I really care enough to stop and help this man like the Samaritan did? Do I really care enough to not only stop and help him, but bind up his wounds, take him to a place an inn, a hotel we can rest and heal, give the innkeeper some of my money that God has blessed me with, and then tell him if it goes beyond this, when I come back through, just bill me and I'll pay you when I come back through. First of all, the man had to have integrity, right? Because you're not going to keep somebody and you run a place of business if you don't think that man is going to come back through and pay you. This guy obviously had to have a good reputation, right? Now, now, again, let me say this right quick. Some of you sitting here right now, if you told somebody you're going to pay them a week later, they ain't going to they they help them. Hello? That's why it's important that we be men and women of what? Integrity. So that our word is our bond. If you tell them, when I come back through, I'm going to take care of the bill, they need to know that you're the type of person who will do what? Take care of the bill. Now watch this. Key thought number one. When knowledge merely informs us, it's of little to no value. Coming to church and learning scripture and learning what the Bible says, if all you're doing is being informed, it's of little to no value. Are y'all listening to me? When knowledge merely informs us, it's of little to no value. Y'all got that? Second thing I want you to just kind of make a, a mental note of is this. When knowledge penetrates our heart and inspires us to love by expressing compassion and sharing hope, that's living out our faith. I know it's a little lengthy, but I want you to write that one down. When knowledge penetrates our heart and inspires us to love by expressing compassion and sharing that hope that's within us, that's living out our faith. Everybody say, that's living it out. 
when that knowledge penetrates our hearts, when what I told you today will cause you to think introspectively and will cause you to begin to look for those people who God places in your path, somebody at work you know right now, you're thinking about it, that's the person who God has put in my path. I need to go minister to that person this week. Somebody in your family, God has put in your path. When knowledge penetrates your heart and it inspires you to love by expressing compassion and sharing hope, that's living out our faith. What does James 1 and 22 say? It says what? Be ye doers of the word and what? And not hearers only, deceiving your own self. That's what James 1 and 22 says. That's living our faith right there when we allow what we hear to penetrate our heart and inspire us to love by expressing compassion and sharing hope, okay? Third, third thing I want you to just write down for good measure. The parable of the Good Samaritan reinforces that life is truly realized when we put our faith into action. The parable of the Good Samaritan reinforces that life is truly realized when we put our faith into action. Guys, when we come and learn all this stuff, you come to Sunday school class and Bible study, but if none of this stuff is causing you uh, to, to put your faith in action, then what good does it do? I mean, you come here and you may feel good about yourself, but see, God is looking for action on our part. And guys, he tests us all the time. He put people, situations, and circumstances in our life to help us get to where we need to be. The parable of the Good Samaritan reinforces that life is truly realized when we put our faith into action. Real quickly, Romans, the third chapter, verse number 27. Romans 3 and 27. Can you pop it up real quickly? I got to move. Romans 3, 27. Watch what the text says here. It says, can we boast then that we have done anything to be accepted by God? No, because our acquittal is not based on obeying the law. It's based on faith. This is Paul talking to the saints in Rome as he was trying to get them to understand that, that their salvation is not based on keeping the law, but their salvation is based on faith in Christ Jesus and him alone, and that faith moves you to act. That faith moves you to do something. True faith will result in corresponding action. The Bible says faith without what works is what? Dead. So you can come and sing about it. You can preach about it. You can tell others about it. But if your faith is not moving you to do something, it's dead faith. Everybody says dead faith. Last point I'm going to give you right here. Um, all Christians are commanded. Hear me carefully. All Christians. Everybody say all. All Christians are commanded and expected to genuinely love and care for and about people in our lives and those within our reach. Get that down. All Christians are, everybody say commanded. Now, command is mean, means not an option. We don't have an option to do it or not do it if we say we're saved. All Christians are commanded and expected to genuinely love and care for and about people in our lives and those within our reach. You have some people in your life and in your reach that, that I may never be around or who may not even relate to me and respond to me. But I promise you, I got some that, you, that may not respond to you, you may never relate to. God places us strategically in places and he empowers us with his love to help people, to show that we really care. Y'all got that? All right, all right, all right. Now, now, so, 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 uh, you know, a lot of times when we, you know, when we understand this, uh, there, there are people in, in the church that are carrying some burden, dealing with some tough stuff, and they, they may be doubting, they may be afraid, 
Um, and, and again, the situation of this man in the parable, it was very obvious. But what I'm, what I'm getting to is one of the reasons why we got to become more relational is because there are people in this church right now, people in your path, people in your family, people at your place of employment who, who are struggling, but they're not going to come out and just say, I'm struggling. There are people who God has strategically placed you in front of to be able to measure them, but you won't open your mouth. You won't even make the first step toward being relational. They're not going to come. You, you may not even see that they're hurting, but they're hurting. And you'll never know that until you become relational rather than just transactional. We only do stuff when somebody asks to do something or, or, or we, we know that there's a need. There's some times people aren't going to say a word. And, and, and so, so let, let me give you some reasons why people <laughs> may not be willing to disclose their struggles. Can I give you that? Some reasons why people may not be willing to disclose their struggles. And that's why you and I as born again believers have to become more relational and realize that God saved us. He loves us to express that love and concern for other people. First of all, uh, <laughs> they don't want others to think less of them. So people sometimes won't, won't tell you that I got, I'm struggling with alcohol. People may not tell you I'm struggling, I got a drug addiction. I'm in the church, I'm singing in the choir, but I'm smoking weed on Friday and Saturday. Hello. I'm serving on the usher board and I'm married, but I got a side chick. Hello. Hello. I'm singing in the choir, and I just sung how great thou art, God, and God, you, you keep on keeping me, but you keep on giving yourself to that dude you're not married to or to that lady who you're not married to. You know what I mean by giving yourself, right? Fornicating, having sex. Hello. Struggling, but won't tell nobody. Maybe you are the person who's a little chatty and gossipy. And you struggle with listening to gossip. How many of us are seeing? Oh, y'all didn't know it was sin. You didn't know it was sin to gossip? Well, I'm just listening, Pastor. Wait a minute. Why do you just want to listen? Tell the person, hey, if you got to alter with that person, do it. The Bible says go to them one-on-one. -on -one. If there's something that you heard that, that, was, that was unbecoming, listen, you don't have to, you know, quit trying to get into everybody else's business and, 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 and learn to love people and, and be relational and God will help that person become comfortable with you enough to share with you their struggle. So sometimes they don't, they don't, they don't want others to, to think less of them. That's why they won't share. Number two, they haven't found the right person who's safe enough. That's why sometimes people won't, won't share their struggles. The guy in the parable, we knew. He was on the side of the road. You couldn't miss him. But what about that person in church? What about that person in your family? What about that person at work who needs to hear an encouraging word from God, who needs to know that somebody really cares about them but you're too busy to be relational. I ain't got time for that. Remember on Bible study night we had our discussion when the Bible says about cheerfully to, uh, to, to, to entertain guests in your home and to, and to, and to feed them? And y'all gave me all the reasons why people don't. You said people don't, but I know some of it was, was, was your, 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 your little struggle too. They may stay too long. They may be nasty. Last time I let somebody stay, they hurt me. They did something, this, they did that. So all those reasons we give and excuses, I'm saying excuses. Because when the Bible says do it, we got to do it. All right? So, but sometimes, again, they haven't found the right person who's safe enough. Number three, they're afraid that gossip, judgment, and rejection might follow the revealing of their struggle. They're afraid that gossip, judgment, and rejection might follow when they share with you what they're struggling with. Guys, let me tell you something. We need people in our life who we can be transparent with. And too many of us in, in the body of Christ uh, have failed to do this because of these reasons right here. So that's why 
as a pastor, I want to get all of us geared up to show that we really care. But people may not be willing to disclose the struggles because they're afraid that gossip, in other words, you told them, but then they went and told all their family members about what they're struggling with. Don't do that. Amen? Quick, if somebody comes to you in confidence, keep it there. Amen? So people are afraid of gossip, judgment, and rejection might follow. Uh, lastly, they tried sharing in the past, but it backfired, and they don't want to get hurt again. They tried sharing in the past, but it backfired, and they don't want to get hurt again. The Good Samaritan exuded and exemplified God's love. Are y'all listening to me? So, 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 Brother Pastor get, closes out with two key points. Let me get, y'all got those? Did y'all get that? So, two key points I'm going to close out with. Caring requires us to be attentive. Caring requires us to pay attention, to be attentive. The Good Samaritan saw the man, but not only did he see the man, he, he, he diagnosed and discerned what the need was, appropriately got the guy to a stabilized position, put him up, paid for his room, allowed him to heal. Sometimes you got to allow people to heal. But that'll happen if we don't show that we really care. Some people just need to know that you care enough about them to sit down and listen to them. You may not have the right words to say, but just be there. It's about presence, not programs. Caring requires us to be attentive. And point number two, and I'm closing on this one. Caring is about serving others. If you're selfish, if it's all about you, what you want, when you want it, how you want it, you'll never distribute the type of love and care that God desires and has commanded for us to show. Caring is about serving others. And if we're honest about it, many times we're just selfish. Y'all told me that on Wednesday night, didn't you? Sometimes we're just selfish. We don't want to be bothered with people. Can, can, we, can we have some confession? Have you ever had a time when you didn't want to be bothered with nobody? I need to see some hands raised. Come on, confess is good for the soul. Now, all y'all in here saved, huh? You say, you say, how many y'all saved? Let me see. Let me see. All right, now, put your hands down. Now, how many there have been times you, you didn't want to be bothered with people? Okay. So now we got a problem, though. So when that, when that, when that comes up, we got a command to serve others. We have a command to minister. So we got to overcome our flesh and overcome our selfishness. Because if we really care, it's going to show in our service to others. Amen? Jesus gave his life so that you and I could be in a position to show that we really care. And I, I, I believe this with all my heart, that, that the EBC, fellow EBC members, God has graced us and he has blessed us to be a blessing. And so we got to make sure that we exemplify the type of care that God desired for us to have. The Good Samaritan showed it. My question to you is, do you really care? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, we thank you and we praise you for this divine opportunity. You are a God who loves us and you are a God who watches over your word 